Hello, welcome to part three of my genealogy series. And today um, I'm going to take a break from showing you how to trace uh, your family tree and just concentrate on um, pointing you in the direction of some useful websites. Now the web is full of useful information for you if you're researching your family tree. Um, so much so that, that there are things on it that you would, it would just never occur to you to look for them. Um, and I'm going to give you a few examples of the sort of things you can find just by Googling. Um, but I'm going to start off with the, the sort of principal sites, the sort of places where you have to start and then develop from there. So there are a great many sites to which you have to subscribe. Um, and I've mentioned a few of them in episode one. This is one of the principal ones. Um, and I think in episode one, I refer to it as ancestry.com. It's actually ancestry.co.uk. Now this is a brilliant site. Um, there's masses on it for you to um, search. Um, but the, I, I don't really think there's a great deal of point in belonging to this and to find my pass, which is the one that I use. Um, but this one is linked closely to the Family Tree Maker software that I showed you in episode one. And when you buy Family Tree Maker, it often comes with a, a free membership of this site for a limited period. Um, so it does sort of tend to push you in the direction of, of subscribing to this site. But the, the one thing that I don't like um, about that is that even though the subscription is free, say for the first three months, you have to supply your credit card details right at the beginning. Um, and I don't see the point of that. Um, so the last time I bought Family Tree Maker, the, the latest version, um, I just ignored the fact that it came with a free subscription. But um, having said that, th this site is brilliant, as I say. Um, there's plenty on it for you to investigate in the way of military records and um, American census records, all that kind of thing. A lot more than just the, the basics. Um, and it's a perfectly good site to belong to. My own preference is for Find My Past, which is www.findmypast.co.uk. It has a very similar um, type of archive to Ancestry. Um, I, I, I get the impression that this is more um, local to the UK, shall we say. Um, because Ancestry is so closely linked with the Mormon database, um, that is more of a, that has more of a sort of worldwide flavour to it. Find My Past um, seems to have a slightly better um, uh, collection of things like English newspapers and articles like that. Um, so there isn't a great deal to choose between the two, but. I, I prefer Find My Past, and I have, in fact, uh, benefited from that. They have a very good um, help kind of desk where you get um, people um, who will respond to your inquiries and give you tips on how to solve various problems with um, your searches in the censuses and things like that, um, and I've found them very helpful. Um, with, with personal advice, um, so I, I, I prefer them anyway. Next up you have Genes Reunited, um, which you can find at www.genesreunited.co.uk. Now this site was a spin-off of Friends Reunited, um, and I'm, I haven't even seen Friends Reunited advertised recently. I, th I think Facebook 
basically um, killed it off because everybody contacts their ex-school friends and so on via Facebook nowadays. But Genes Reunited has survived because of the popularity of family history research. And it's got this really kind of um, unique twist on, on a genealogical website. It has all the usual databases, such as the um, index numbers for the registry office, um, census records, newspaper accounts, that kind of thing. Um, but it, it also allows you to um, enter your family tree onto the website. And then it will um, investigate that tree for you and if it finds any matches of names and dates of birth and so on with the um, family trees of other subscribers, it will um, highlight them as a hot match. And um, you are then given the opportunity to contact that other member. Um, privately through the site so that you don't exchange email addresses um, and then you can exchange details of your tree you can allow that person to see your tree and they can allow you to see theirs and that way you can um, graft one tree onto another um, so your tree can rapidly expand now that does mean that if you wanted to you could do without your own family tree software such as family tree maker but um, i have found that there's a, a tiny bit of a problem with this in that um, if you enter a name that is very common such as john smith you will be deluged with matches from other people's trees and um, you can't see the, the wood for the trees, excuse the pun, um, but you, you'll, you'll start to ignore relevant matches because you know that the John Smith you're interested in can't possibly be the same as the John Smith who was born in New York or something like that when you're looking for someone who was born in the East End of London. Um, so I've, I've found what I've actually done is prune my tree down on this site to the only um, the members of my family who I am really interested in pursuing um, and doing it that way. And the other thing that is a little bit annoying is that you'll get people asking to see your tree and then won't reciprocate. Um, so they don't. They, they, they aren't courteous enough to allow you to see their tree and what I normally do in those circumstances is um, after a couple of days if they haven't reciprocated I, I block their view of my tree again but there are there are members of this site um, who have been invaluable to me um, in extending my knowledge of my own family and um, We've um, had a reciprocal viewing arrangement of our trees for many years now, and they've never um, ratted on that. Um, so I can strongly recommend this site as being a very good way of um, expanding your tree. And not only that, but potentially getting in contact with um, distant cousins and so on um, who you were previously unaware of their existence and and there have been stories on this site of people finding their siblings and so on who they've lost touch with so it has a, a number of valuable uses those previous three sites um, were all subscription sites so there are, there are parts of them that you can access for free but in general you have to pay um, to be a member of them this site, Family Search, is free to join. And you can find it on familysearch.org. Now, this site is essentially the International Genealogical Index that I was talking to you 
about on in episode one. Um, it's the it's the database of the Mormon Church, um, and it's the same sort of thing that you can look at if you visit a, a Mormon church and um, go into their their family archive room, and they have one of those in each one of their churches. Um, and it's it's useful for a number of reasons. I mean, uh, other than it doesn't cost you anything to join. Um, it supplements a lot of the other sites rather than duplicating them, um, in particular with regard to parish records. I haven't actually gone in, gone into the subject of parish records with you in this series yet, um, because we haven't got back as far as 1837, and that's when the parish records really become useful, because they are your only way of tracing your family back before the days of registration of births, deaths and marriages. So every church from the uh, Tudor period was obliged to keep a, a, a written record of all the people that were baptised, um, were married or were buried in that church. And then those records were um, sent on to the uh, local bishopric. Um, and the genealogical websites are not complete in their collections of parish registers, um, parish records, because they are still um, acquiring them and accumulating them. And this particular website um, has a lot of parish records that you, you still won't find on any of the, the other three sites that I've shown you. Um, so it's particularly good at, at you sorting out areas of the country, really. For instance, um, they're catching up now, but those three sites didn't have a great deal of records on Shropshire, where a lot of my family um, originate from. So I found this site very good for that. But on top of that, they do, they do have other things as well. They've, they've, they've got a lot of um, details of... The American census. So if you have a, a member of your family who's emigrated to America, you can trace their descendants down through the American census records. And I've even found um, a case in my brother-in-law's family um, of, a, of a group of people who emigrated to the US. And then I have found details of their draft records um, from the 1940s. Um, so I've been able to find their addresses of where they were living in New York um, as recently as the 1940s. So it's all it's all additional information that you might not get from one of those other websites, and it's free. So it's a, a really um, handy thing to have around. You will need to have a record of this website if you intend to order any birth, death or marriage certificates. Uh, this is the General Register Office website which can be found on uh, www.gro.gov.uk. Remember that to use their services you'll need to supply them with um, the details of the certificate that you wish to purchase. So. Um, you'll need details such as the district, uh, the volume and page number of the index and uh, obviously the quarter of the year, the particular year um, when the registration was made. And again, another slight correction to something I said in episode one. I, I said the certificates were about £9. In fact, they're £9.25. So um, slightly more expensive than I suggested. OK, now I touched on the subject of migration a moment ago. And the genealogical websites often have very good um, travel and migration sections where you can find um, details of ships, uh, passengers and so on, which ships that you're um, relatives sailed on um, 
not just to emigrate, but sometimes just to cross the Atlantic on business or something like that, or um, traveling out to various reaches of the empire, um, such as Ceylon and India. Um, so you can find details of their travel and their migration on those sites. But the receiving countries as well often have records. Um, and in particular, um, there are details of, of uh, migrants to the United States kept at Ellis Island um, only from, a, I think it's 1891, so um, not the sort of mid 19th century. Um, but again, it's a very useful um, set of records and you can find this website on www.LibertyEllisFoundation.org and the records here will often tell you where the migrant was intending to travel um, so they will give you a, the name of a city something like that and then you can then pursue that on the family research website by checking later censuses in that region There's a slim possibility that you might have someone in your family who was forcibly uh, transported to Australia, um, in which case you might find details of their records at this site here, um, which is the Convict Records site of Australia, www.convictrecords.com.au. And in a similar vein, if you have a relative that has been tried at the Old Bailey or been involved as a witness at the Old Bailey um, between the periods 1674 and 1913, then you might find uh, snippets of information about the court case here at um, www.oldbaileyonline.org. This is a website that I've found um, interesting and useful um, in researching a couple of the names on my tree that I've been um, exploring. And um, essentially, there are such things as public records, and um, they go back, I, I think, before the days of the Napoleonic Wars. Um, and essentially, you probably you probably heard the phrase to be gazetted. Um, now, that used to mean that your name would be placed in a gazette. Um, there was the London Gazette. I believe there was a Scottish Gazette as well. And you could get your name into a gazette for a number of reasons. One, one would be um, if you had been awarded a medal of distinction. So not a, a sort of ordinary campaign medal, but... Um, something like the VC or the uh, Distinguished uh, Service Medal, something like that, DSO, DCM, um, or if you were mentioned in dispatches uh, for a particular act of heroism, um, but also if you were bankrupted um, or um, locked into a debtor's prison, which was a common fate um, in the early 19th century, then your name and, and the details of the court case would be placed in the London Gazette. And everything um, that was printed in those newspapers is now available um, free to view on this website, which is www.gazettes.com online.co.uk so to give you an example um, my grandfather uh, had a brother-in-law so the husband of his sister um, who was awarded the distinguished conduct medal in the first world war and all I had to do was type his name into the search function on this website and it came up with um, a description of how he how he was actually awarded this medal the the um what heroic feat he performed but you you can actually go to the website with any without any knowledge of 
any particular distinguished conduct in a member of your family and type in names and you find out um, a lot of things that uh, you, you wouldn't expect to find, um, particularly in the opposite case of things where people want to keep things quiet, such as uh, bankrupt, bankruptcy proceedings and so on. You can find, um, find that at one stage or another they had financial difficulties and details of their businesses and where they lived and so on. So it's, it's a good website to explore. It was often the case, though, that um, people did want their businesses known about. Um, and before the days of yellow pages, um, they would often print something um, to be included in local directories. Um, and the University of Leicester has a good uh, collection of local directories, which, um, again, is worth worth investigating if, if you find an occupation on a census of one of your relatives, such as a grocer or any kind of trader or um, shopkeeper, that sort of thing, um, then you might be able to find their name and address and other other information um, about what they were up to on this site, which is um, specialcollections dot le dot ac dot uk and the modern day equivalent of that if um, you've traced the descendants of someone and know that they're still alive um, electoral rolls and telephone directories uh, yellow pages that kind of thing are amalgamated into this site which is 192.com um, which is a, a useful way of uh, tracking the living descendants of people who might be on your tree. So you can find this web page at www.192.com. Um, you do have to subscribe to this, it's not a free service. If there was a member of your family who was a casualty of war in, in any of the wars from the Great War onwards, um, then you'll be able to find their record, um, their name and the, where they are buried. Um, and very often um, details of their family, um, such as their hometown, um, where their parents or their wives and spouses were were living at www.cwgc.org which is the Commonwealth War, Grave, War Graves Commission. I found this website particularly useful and um, not always in ways that you might think. Um, uh, the censuses for instance uh, as you know from one of the previous episodes are only released after a hundred years um, so the 1921, even the 1921 census isn't released yet, um, but you will often get the addresses of uh, people from this website. Um, so places where your family members were living in the 20s, 30s, 40s and so on. Um, so it's quite good for that. And, and it's also useful just to type a name in if you've got an unusual surname. Um, and you'll find you might find members of your family whose existence you didn't know of before now um, so it is it's, it's a good website just to explore and, and you also get um, not photographs of the stone in particular but you will get you will often get a photograph of the cemetery that your relative is buried in and um, sometimes those plots especially for the First World War grave sites on the Western Front were quite small. Um, some of them no bigger than the size of a, a an average garden. Um, so they're 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 quite intimate, and it's a good it's a good website to go to again for information that other than um, just details of a person's death um, during a war. To give you an example, um, on my mother's side um, there was one particular 
family that she's descended from and uh, three generations of that family were killed um, simultaneously when a bomb hit uh, uh, an air raid shelter that they were sheltering in in South London and um, if I hadn't looked at this website I wouldn't have been aware of the names of the young children in particular who um, were, were killed in that event. Next up I'd like to mention the National Library of Scotland which is a really good website if you're researching your family history and not necessarily if you have Scottish family. Um, for instance I've, I've discovered that they for some reason they have hundreds literally hundreds of maps of local areas and towns and cities in England um, so I have got some very detailed maps uh, dating back to the mid 19th century of places like um, Plymouth where I live and um, Essex all kinds of places um, and I, I find maps really helpful um, just in adding a little bit of color to your family history research because you can get a very good impression of the type of neighborhood that your family lived in. Um, you can see all the surrounding buildings, um, factories and canals and so on, if they live in, a, in a, uh, an industrial area or parkland and gardens if they live in the suburbs. Um, so I, I, I can recommend this site for that alone, but they've got a lot more, as you can see, they've got a lot more as well. Um, so that's the National Library of Scotland and they are www.nls.uk they will send the maps to you in digital form on a cd and it's not cheap um, i think i paid about nine no not 19 13 pounds i think it was for one image um, recently but i actually prefer that um, to buying printed maps nowadays but um, this is a very good supply of printed maps they're called Alan Godfrey maps um, their website is www.alangodfreymaps that's all one word .co.uk um, and the advantage of having the printed map is that um, they fill the reverse side of the map um, with a lot of local history um, so very very well written descriptions of how the town had developed um, up until the period of the map um, with a lot of little, lot of things that you wouldn't um, find in other in other in other literature so um, I would recommend this this website as well a very good Okay, this is a grave site that allows you to find um, details of a particular um, grave um, because monumental inscriptions on gravestones are a very good uh, supply of further family history detail. Um, but of course, inevitably, um, a website like this is going to be far from uh, complete, comprehensive. Um, no one has the time to go around and photograph every gravestone in every cemetery so this relies on um, sort of individual contributions from subscribers um, there, there are a lot of uh, cemeteries which um, do publish the details of the, the people interred in them um, but they they tend to sort of come and go on the website I mean for instance uh, a lot of my family stem from Wolverhampton and at one time Wolverhampton archives were all over the website um, the, the local council seemed to feature them and there was lots of family history research um, information on their website it was superb but now that all seems to have disappeared um, and fortunately I downloaded it before it disappeared but they had um, 
the details of all the people that had been interred in Maryvale Cemetery in Wolverhampton. Um, and that has the names of dozens of members of my family. Um, and you won't you won't find those on this website, um, but uh, you'd be surprised what you can find. I, I've found um, records of members of my mother's family who um, emigrated to America and uh, are, are buried in a graveyard in Texas, and that just happens to be on here. So um, it's it's an interesting website to explore. So that's www.findagrave.com This is a website that um, doesn't get a lot of mention but I think I think it deserves a lot of lot more publicity. Um, it's a it's a pro it's a profiler of surnames um, and essentially what you do is you type in a search of your um, surname and it will give you the results of their their distribution across the country either in 1881 or 1998 um, and it, it really helps to point you in the direction of where your family members might have been living in 1881 i'll, I'll show you what it comes up with for the astley surname so here we are, this is 1881, and the darker the shade of blue, the more concentrated um, the owners of the Astley name are in that area. And um, if, you, if you watched episode one in this series, um, you would have heard me say that my father was convinced of his Lancastrian ancestry, and that was supported by the fact that there are so many Astleys in Lancashire, and you can see that on the map, but um, it turned out that we stem from um, Astley's in the West Midlands, um, but you can now see that um, those Astley members almost certainly spilled over from Wales, and it never occurred to any of us that um, we were of Welsh descent. Um, uh, it, Astley just doesn't sound like a, a Welsh surname, but Having looked into it further, um, it's a very common Welsh surname, uh, particularly in that area of mid Wales. And the map on the right there is the London area in 1881. So I can immediately tell from that that I don't need to bother looking at uh, London records to search for Astley's in the Victorian period. You can find this website at gbnames.publicprofiler.org. Now at some stage you may want to find out a bit more about your very distant ancestors and um, DNA testing has become a very um, uh, profitable enterprise in its own right. Um, I've done it. I use this uh, company here, DNA Worldwide. Um, I'm not going to go into the uh, science of DNA testing at this point, um, other than to say uh, that uh, you should be prepared to be a little bit disappointed because the findings aren't likely to be very detailed or specific. Um, but having said that, um, my particular test did seem to confirm um, a sort of Celtic origin, um, which would support the uh, profile on the 1881 census that I just showed you. So these people can be found at www.dna-worldwide.com. And I'm sure there are plenty of other DNA testing organizations out there um, and I haven't checked many of them out so I can't give you a comparison um, but the thing that I did like about this website is that they um, they do try to link you up to a database if you're prepared to put your name on it 
Um, so there's the, the database is so small um, in comparison to the world's population, but um, there's a slim possibility of you finding matches with your own DNA, um, especially the uh, sort of lower and on the lower end of the scale. So you can you can find people who are remotely similar to yourself genetically, um, but to find a perfect match is a bit like looking at a, for a needle in a haystack. Um, uh, obviously, if some of my Astley cousins were to do the test, then there'd be a, a perfect match of our Y DNA. Um, but that's not likely to happen. But it is it is interesting to look at this. Um, website and to look at the matches and to see whether there's any similarity in in the surnames for instance um, there were certainly a lot of other Welsh sounding surnames that I matched up with um, such as Davis and Ellis um, but the, the the connection on your family tree is likely to be thousands if not tens of thousands of years distant so you're never going to be able to trace that um, through parish records and so on this is a website that I love and um, it's all run by one single chap I think he's got a medical background um, I think he may even be American um, and it's non-profit making, although he does invite you to donate uh, to the costs of running the website. Um, and essentially what this is, is um, an explanation of a, lot of a lot of the medical terms that you find on death certificates. But this is not, I'm not talking about modern death certificates, I'm talking about ones from the early period of registration. So the early and mid Victorian period and at that time um, doctors were very uh, careless about the terms that they used and, and used very generic descriptions um, and slowly over the years uh, they've been um, disciplined into keeping a sort of strict language but in, in the early Victorian period and a lot, of, a lot of death certificates you find the most bizarre causes of death um, often written in Latin or um, quaint phrases for a particular condition and you can get a death certificate and haven't, haven't, you won't have a clue what it was that actually killed your ancestor um, what this chap invites you to do if you do come across a death certificate like that is to take a little um, cutting of the certificate, a copy of it, and um, post it to him and he'll include it in his database. And it's it's an absolutely fantastic website just to roam through um, looking at all these peculiar phrases. So for instance on the right hand side there um, you might see a cause of death um, written down as Noli Me Tangere um, which is actually the Latin for don't touch me. Um, so I was immediately intrigued by that and looked up its meaning. And here we are, it's an archaic term for lupus, um, which is a condition um, where patients um, can't tolerate being touched because of the uh, sensitivity of their skin. And the more you look, the more you want to explore, because I was immediately drawn to noodle pox, whatever that is. Um, obviously, it's serious because it caused at least one person's death. But you can go on like that for ages with this website. So this website is uh, www.antiquismorbus.com. And like antiquismorbus.com, there are lots of websites out there where individuals have just accumulated a vast array of data on a particularly obscure subject. Um, and this is another one that I love, um, which is a little bit more fanciful and of less use than finding out 
medical terms. Um, but it's good fun, nevertheless. It's um, a chap called Jamie Allen's uh, family tree, and um, he's incorporated in, into it all the um, fant fantastical pedigrees that he can discover. Um, basically, lots of people in the Middle Ages and, and the Dark Ages um, wanted to kind of confirm their pedigrees. So they had um, descents written out for them um, by so-called scholars um, so that they could claim descent from characters in mythology or or the Old Testament. Um, and there's just tons on this website, absolutely tons. Um, but what happens if, if you do happen by chance to find on your family tree that your distant ancestor married into a noble family or something like that and you've got the slightest chance of linking up with nobility or royal family then you can then trace that person back all the way to someone like Hercules or Noah or um, Jason from Jason and the Arg Arg Argonauts or Thor or something like that um, uh, it's just a bit. It's a bit of fun, but it. But what impresses me is the amount of work that this guy's put into this website. So um, have a look at it just to support him. So you can find this website at fabpedigree.com. It's really worth having a look at. Now another tip is to explore just keep keep exploring the web because um there are millions i would suspect of individual um blogs relating to family history um specific families so if if you find a name on your on your family tree just type it into google and see what you come up with um and very often you'll find that there is someone else who is investigating the same family name and has published a lot of their findings on the web. Um, there's no point in you giving the website of this address, but it's, a, it's a, a case in point of someone who's been exploring the, the Sayers, the Isteds and the Scarlets. Um, the Isteds were a particularly uh, notable family in, in Sussex. Um, but that's the kind of thing I mean. Just just have a look and see what you can find. And that doesn't just go for surnames. Um, it goes for all kinds of other things. I mean, this Palo Pinti is a county in Texas. And um, I looked it up, having discovered that some of my um, mother's relatives emigrated to Texas back in the late 19th century. And um, I was able to find... Um, details of the family just from this uh, website related to that particular county in Texas so it, it just goes to show what you can discover just by looking. This is another example I was I was helping a friend with his family research and we came across a um, profession of one of his ancestors uh, as being a cork cutter and uh, not only does it turn out that that was um, uh, quite a common profession in the 19th century, but there's also a website dedicated to the whole thing. Um, so you can explore the conditions that they worked in and what the process involved, where, where the corks went, what kind of bottles they stopped. Uh, it just goes on and on. So that's the end of this episode. I hope you've found that useful. Um, the message is really just explore the internet and, and don't stop exploring because you'll, you'll not only find out additional details about your ancestors, but it'll add flavour to your family tree. You'll find out about the conditions they lived and worked in and um, all kinds of other historical um, details. Um, so I'll say goodbye at this point and in the next episode we'll get back to 
pushing the Astley family tree back a little bit further. So see you then. Bye.